Cluck from NOAA. And uh, once again, we're bringing you the monthly North Central U.S. climate uh, out, tri climate drought flood summary outlook uh, for August. Uh, Aaron Wilson from the Ohio State University is uh, is the presenter today. After it's over, uh, well, any time during the presentation, you can jot down any questions that come to mind uh, in the question area, and we'll get to those at the end. So uh, when Aaron's done in about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, uh, we'll move into the question part. So if anything arises, or if you have questions now, it's fine, uh, and you want to stick around and, and listen to that. We'll try to wrap this up around 2 p.m. Central Time. So, Aaron, um, I'm just going to hand it over to you. I think you are not in presentation mode yet. Uh, there you go. All right. Take it away, Aaron, and thank you very much for uh, for helping out this month. Absolutely. Thank you, Doug. Uh, thanks to everyone that's joining on the, the broadcast today. Uh, this is August 15th, 2019, and like Doug said, I'm from The Ohio State University. I uh, work with both the OSU Extension as well as the State Climate Office of Ohio. Uh, just some uh, business to take care of like we usually do here. Um, if we can get it to move forward for you. There we go. Uh, these services, the climate services for the North Central uh, U.S., including the Great Plains and the Midwest, are really provided through this collaboration of federal, regional, and state partners. So you can see the list there from NOAA, USDA Climate Hubs, uh, the Association of State Climatologists and the state climatologists around around the region. Uh, our regional climate centers, both the High Plains and Midwest, as well as the National Drought Mitigation Center. Uh, go ahead and mark your calendars. Uh, the next regular climate and drought outlook webinar uh, will be the third Thursday of September. That's September 19th at 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Uh, the presenter this uh, for, for next time will be Adnan Akius. Uh, North Dakota State Climatologist and the uh, American Association of State Climatologists President. Uh, as always, you can find uh, you know future climate webinars and access to these webinars at the the links provided there. And as Doug mentioned, we'll open it up for questions here uh, at the end. Uh, the agenda is, is uh, you know pretty standard for those that have been you know following uh, the webinars. Here we're going to look at the current climate conditions in a historical context. Uh, from temperatures and precip and some other conditions here. We'll focus on some of the area impacts and uh, to agriculture, to water, uh, and some other uh, interesting tidbits and events that we've had happen across the region uh, over the last month. And then we'll take a look at our climate outlooks. Uh, we'll look at the, you know what tropical influence there may be in terms of our, our weather patterns here across the country and get a first glimpse really at the heart or the meat of the harvest season coming up uh, for that September, October, and November timeframe. So we'll start with the July temperature recap. Uh, this is uh, the state climate, um, state of the climate uh, recap here from NOAA, looking at statewide average temperature ranks for July of 2019. Again, this is compared for the period of 1895 through 2019. Uh, the contiguous U.S. had the 27th warmest. Uh, that should be July on record, not May, but July on record. Uh, above average conditions, uh, as you can see, shaded in the peach and, and orange colors there uh, across much of the eastern Midwest region. So uh, places like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, extending even up into northern parts of the Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan as well. On the other side, uh, toward the central and northern plains, uh, the white shading is indicating state ranks that are that are near average. Uh, so temperatures over, overall weren't uh, uh, were, were close to average, um, extending from the Great Plains out toward uh, Montana and Wyoming. Uh, another area of warmth was there in Colorado, so you can see that also in that light orange or peach shading. A lot of these were. Uh, you know the warmer the warmer temperatures are the above to much above we're in that that warmer tier uh, Ohio they're approaching basically the 11th uh, warmest July uh, on record switching to the July precipitation recap now it's a little bit more heterogeneous across the region but there are some general trends here uh, for the entire US we had slightly below average precipitation actually uh, but really fell in that middle third tier in terms of this, the rankings 
uh, between 1895 and 2019. Uh, it was wet uh, for many folks across the Midwest and the Great Plains states, and especially so in South Dakota. Uh, so this was the third wettest July there in South Dakota. Uh, many of the states, Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, also in Nebraska and Missouri, had above average precipitation. Uh, we, we had some other states that were, that were close to average. That's that white shading again, Wyoming, Iowa, uh, Michigan, uh, Indiana, and Ohio. Um, and, and then below average, two states here, three states in our region, Illinois, uh, Kansas, and also Colorado. So kind of a, a varied conditions here. And, and certainly we've had a shift uh, between, uh, between uh, wet, wet, wetter conditions and drier conditions. Uh, across the eastern Corn Belt region or the east, eastern part of the Midwest here and, and really wet conditions maintaining there in, in the central Great Plains, northern Great Plains. So we can look at the three month transition. I think the gradient shows up uh, really nicely here. This is the statewide average temperature ranks May through uh, July. Again, sorry, yeah, with the temperature ranks toward the western states for these three months, they averaged, they were below average in general. Uh, to more near average conditions from Minnesota down through Missouri, Wisconsin, and Illinois, and then warmer than average conditions there in Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. So this gradient from west to east in terms of the temperatures across our region. As far as precipitation goes for the three months, it was pretty much, uh, you know, much above or above to much above average across most states uh, here across the plains in the Midwest. Uh, the exceptions being North Dakota and Montana, which were a little bit closer than to average. Uh, but we had some states, for instance, like Missouri, we're talking about the fourth wettest three-month period here. Uh, very wet conditions out in Nebraska, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota. And then again, uh, parts of Ohio and Michigan as well. So really, uh, I think one thing, you know, looking at the July ranks and then looking at the longer period here, the three months, it really illustrates this switch in the reg regime for some states, particularly in the Eastern Corn Belt region and, and, and parts of Kansas as well from, from these conditions. To broaden that out even further, we're looking at the 12 month precipitation recap and you see a lot of dark greens here for many of the states uh, uh, of interest. Uh, many of these are the wettest 12 month August to July period on record. Uh, that's indicated by the 124. So for places like Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and South Dakota. Again, this was the wettest 12 month August to July on record. And it really continues the streak for several of these states of, of just back to back to back 12 month periods that were record wettest here. Uh, so despite some even drier conditions across the eastern portion from central Iowa into Ohio and Kentucky, these states were still for the last 12 months very wet. It just gives a good indication of what we've seen over the past month or past year, excuse me. So now getting to some more details about our average temperatures and those departures from average uh, here across our, our region. Uh, there, there are obviously a lot of colors on this map indicating some areas of, of above to much above average temperatures here. So wherever you see the red shading there in Colorado, uh, those are temperatures in that three to four or three to five degrees above average. And that really extended during the last month up into uh, parts of Wyoming, out into uh, western Kansas and parts of Nebraska. And then in that eastern side of things from Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, some uh, temperatures compared to average in that two to four degrees above average uh, uh, window there. Across the northern Great Plains, Montana, the Dakotas, you see the blue or green shadings. Uh, these are indicating departures that are cooler than average. Uh, so anywhere from about a degree or two in the green shadings uh, to the light blue indicating three and, and purples even down around four degrees below average uh, for the last 30 days. And similar conditions uh, below average across parts of uh, eastern Kansas into Missouri and even parts of southern Illinois as well. So uh, this is just, you know, kind of indicating we've got different conditions and different things happening uh, across our, our region here. One good thing this time of year is to show the differences between our, our maximum highs and our max and, and our um, our low temperatures compared to average. Uh, the top left is our 
a departure from normal or average maximum temperatures. Again, if you're looking close to the Great Lakes or in Southern Great Lakes, these, these temperatures are during the daytime have been a, a bit above average. Uh, the same thing can be said for parts of Western uh, Kansas and into Colorado. Kind of that central uh, Northwest to Southeast uh, Dakotas, Montana and Dakotas down into Missouri, where the green shadings are, are indicated. These are highs that are, are below average, have been below average here. Um, the light blue indicating temperatures four to six degrees, daytime highs being a little bit below, or uh, quite a bit below average there across portions of South Dakota. And when we look at the precip, that'll be uh, pretty clear why we're seeing that as well. The opposite side, looking at the minimum temperatures and those departures from normal, you can see a lot of yellows across the region. Now, generally, they've been within, you know, a degree or two, that light green and light and yellow shading, within a degree or two, positive and negative. But in general, we see a lot more area covered by warmer than average overnight lows. So a lot of humidity, a lot of water vapor in the air, overnight lows tend to stay a little bit warmer uh, than they do when we've got drier air. And so uh, this is a good reason for, for what's happening in terms of the minimum temperatures as well. Now, turning our attention to the precip total and percent of normal. So the top uh, left figure is looking at the, the precip amounts. Uh, so for portions uh, of, say, central Iowa into Illinois, Indiana, parts of Michigan, uh, generally what we've seen there over the last 30 days has been anywhere from maybe a half inch of rainfall. Uh, that's all we've really seen across parts of Illinois, up to maybe uh, as much as perhaps five inches in some locations uh, over the last 30 days. Uh, even drier conditions, if you're looking in parts of Colorado and Wyoming, and even uh, close to the Canadian border there in North Dakota. Uh, kind of opposite of that is really a couple of areas. We're looking at South Dakota here with uh, precipitation in that uh, anywhere from six to maybe 11 inches of rainfall there in some parts of, of South Dakota, some pockets there in Nebraska and also Eastern Kansas as well. And then up into parts of Minnesota, Southern Minnesota into Wisconsin, where, where precip has been around that six, six to eight inches of rainfall, for instance. Now compare that to the percent of normal, uh, a couple of distinct, well, several distinct areas show up. You can really see the core of the, the, the deficit in precip. Uh, from parts of central Iowa into central Illinois and Indiana as well, where those red shadings are indicating, you know, less than 50% of normal, half of normal rainfall there. On the opposite side of that, we, we look at the, the kind of purple or pinkish hues across South Dakota, and we're looking at anywhere from, you know, 150 to 300% of normal precip in, the, in that region. So that uh, says a lot too about what, what we're seeing in terms of our temperatures, but of course, all that rainfall is still falling across uh, the Missouri River Basin, right? We've got other um, deficits of rainfall across parts of Southern and Southwestern Kansas, uh, parts of Colorado and extending up into Wyoming. And again, up close uh, to the Canadian border there in, in North Dakota, extending over to Minnesota as well. So if we extend our windows out a little bit, we're looking at 90-day precipitation and, and total precipitation uh, year-to-date, both in percent of normal, mostly green conditions. Again, this, this shift to the dry conditions has been relatively recent uh, for areas from Iowa and Illinois and Indiana and even parts of Ohio as well. Uh, you can see the purple hues from southern Montana and, and Wyoming into South Dakota, south into Nebraska and Kansas. These are indicating over the last 90 days or the, you know, most of the, the summertime here, precipitation in that 150 to 300, 200% of normal. Uh, the year to date is even you know, more clear. Despite the recent dryness, we don't really see that in the year to date across parts of Eastern Corn Belt, Ohio, a little bit in Indiana, but not much in Illinois. Although that anomaly, that difference compared to average, that percent normal has is, is been a bit low there in parts of Iowa. So this is you know, over a year, uh, kind of year to date in terms of, of the amount of precipitation that's falling, a couple of those areas are still standing out. So part, parts of North Dakota, Minnesota, and also Iowa, and even parts of Eastern Colorado. Again, year to date in South Dakota, Nebraska, parts of Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois, still showing uh, you know, differences of normal that are quite, quite positive and in, in the surplus region. So 
despite the recent dry conditions, it's still above average across much of much of the uh, the Midwest and the Great Plains as well. Uh, though it's always about timing too, and so we'll see that the timing effect uh, in some of our our reports from the impacts. So obviously, one of the immediate impacts is soil moisture, and so one of the things that that we can show. Uh, is is a gauge of the amount of soil moisture and its change over time. So in the top right, you're looking at a figure uh, that's basically like a snapshot of the soil moisture compared to a long-term average. Uh, and wherever you see the greens, that's indicating surplus uh, soil moisture is likely to be occurring. Uh, wherever you see the oranges and the reds, that's where we've got deficits in the soil moisture uh, compared to a long-term average here. The white shading again is indicating that close close to average differences. So that bullseye is really focused over South Dakota where it, it's been very wet, extending down into parts of Nebraska as well as into Kansas. Uh, drier soil moisture indicative across Northern North Dakota into Minnesota. Now we can look at how things have changed to get, uh, get an idea just in the last couple of weeks how that, that moisture has changed. And you see across much of the Midwest, a lot of those orange shadings, and that's in the figure here in the middle. Uh, you see, you know, changes where the soil moisture is is, is decreasing. Uh, we're losing that soil moisture content very rapidly in some areas, whereas over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a surplus or a surge, an increase in the soil moisture over parts of eastern Kansas uh, and also parts of, of South Dakota and then western North Dakota as well. And then looking finally at the bottom figure, this is the soil moisture anomaly or the change in those differences compared to average uh, for the entire summer, right? Since Memorial Day here, since May 31st. So it, it really picks out the bullseyes where we're seeing that rapid decline in the soil moisture there across uh, southeastern Iowa and extending into Illinois. Uh, and then we've also got parts of southern uh, Kansas that are showing a major drying effect, that drawdown of the soil moisture uh, being used um, across those regions as well. And what's interesting, I mean, this time of year, obviously, when you get into summertime, you have a lot of uh, convective activity or thunderstorm activity is, is to look at areas that, that receive that scattered activity versus areas that don't. So parts of the eastern Corn Belt region that have not seen heavy, heavy rainfall over the last couple of weeks, though a lot of places have seen some isolated uh, rainfall that uh, can you know you can really see some differences in the soil moisture here. So these are uh, courtesy of Stu Foster and the State Climate Office here in Kentucky, looking at two locations. Uh, the graph is for uh, on the left is for Henderson County, that's the blue star. Uh, Meade County, Kentucky is the red star on the right. And just for purposes of seeing how close these two uh, stations are, I've put the map in the bottom right hand side. So you can see these counties are relatively close. Now the time series that you're seeing here is looking at soil moisture from several different le uh, levels within the soil. So the light blue being just down to about two inches and then all the way down to 40 inches is this orange line here. So in areas that where we've seen uh, rainfall, you see these, these spikes, these um, basically we're looking at the amount of, of water in the soil by volume here. Uh, our, our rain events and these convective rain events, and you can see where the soil moisture has been maintained over, say, the last 90 days, pretty close to the last 90 days. Just a few counties over in Meade County here, you can see essentially since the end of June, this big drawdown in soil moisture at all levels here. So getting quite dry here toward the surface of the soil, the two, four, and, and eight inch moisture uh, levels. And even deeper in the soil that, soil, that soil moisture is decreasing. So this is just an example, an illustrative example of some of the things that are taking place in the Eastern Corn Belt region. As far as our, our stream flows and impacts on, on water flows out there, really across the region, it's above to much above stream flows from the Dakotas, uh, Nebraska, and Kansas, through parts of Southern Minnesota and Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, if you look, see where the black dots are, uh, this is indicating record high flows for this time of year from a historical context in parts of South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, eastern Kansas, and even in central Missouri and south central Illinois. There are some localized low stream flows. Uh, you have to look pretty closely here, but there are some in parts of Illinois and, and Indiana where conditions have been pretty dry, actually from central Illinois, uh, Iowa to Indiana here, and then parts of southeast Indiana and even far north uh, Northwest Kentucky. So these are a, a couple of areas that are starting to show some lower stream flows 
in terms of impact where those drier conditions are. But even, you know, it's been such a wet 12 month period that stream flows, even in that dry core, are still averaging about normal for this time of year. So if we're looking at current flooding, there's no real big problems in much of the upper Mississippi and the Ohio River basins. A lot of focus is in that Missouri River Basin area. Uh, this is a photo from the uh, from Dennis Toddy here looking at the Iowa side of the, uh, the Missouri and some flooding into a casino parking lot there in Council Bluff. Uh, so if you, if you see the, the map on the top right, this is just indicating some stream flow gauges across South Dakota here uh, that are in moderate flood and even major flood stage here. So all of that rainfall, obviously, this uh, the last month or so across South Dakota and repeated rains, obviously, is filling up those, uh, keeping those uh, rivers and tributaries uh, quite full. So much above average precipitation across this core of the Missouri Basin has really hindered a little bit of the, the major reservoir evacuations of water that are taking place. So this update from the Army Corps, just looking at the Missouri River Basin, uh, the, at Gavin's point, the release there is, is still at 70,000 uh, cubic feet per second here. So that's uh, the Army Corps indicates that this, this release is probably going to be maintained through September here, as indicated uh, by this weekly update. Uh, if we're looking in the top right here, this is just the, the total storage compared to other years. So a couple of years of record here, uh, uh, 2018 and, and 2011 is the black curve. And, and you can see right now that the, the, the total system storage is comparable to those, those two years, 2018 and also 2011. Some other water impacts. Uh, we've been talking about the Great Lakes and their water levels, and they continue to, to be maintained uh, at, at record levels here for many of the lakes. So Lake Superior, St. Clair, uh, Erie, and Ontario all set new record levels for the month of July. Uh, the previous records I've indicated in the parentheses there for each of those basins. Uh, the Lake Michigan Huron was within one inch of its, of its record, and that previous record is 1986. Uh, so we've seen and, and heard numerous reports of, of, of flooding along the shore. Um, actually, some local communities that are putting in some no wake uh, rules and, and enforcing no wake so to prevent a little bit more of the erosion that's taking place on properties that are along these lake shores. Um, and what's interesting is that you know Lake Erie and Ontario levels, even though they were record highs, they still dropped from June. Uh, we, we tend to see a, a, a slow uh, drawdown, very slow, uh, over the next few months here. And so, uh, despite those two lakes dropping, they still saw their record levels. Obviously, during the summertime, harmful algal blooms become a, an issue, not just for, for Lake Erie, as I'm showing here, but, but other bodies, as I'll talk, talk about in just a moment. But we definitely have a, a microcystis or, or toxic algae bloom. Uh, in Lake Erie right now, extending from Maumee Bay north uh, along the Michigan coast all the way to Brest Bay here, and then also east along the Ohio coast to the Marblehead Peninsula. Uh, this extends about, you know, you can see the plume and the toxicity here. The, the, basically, this is a satellite image comparing the density uh, of, of what that bloom looks like. Just gives us an indication of the extent here. And you can see it, you know, depending on the mixing and the wind regime, it can mix to other parts of the lake as well. But it's definitely uh, visible, clearly visible along the, the shore of Ohio and Michigan here uh, as we're kind of heading into that peak harmful algal bloom season here for Lake Erie. We also want to, uh, you know, start uh, talk a little bit about the drought tools. There's been some indication and in, across this, uh, you know, drier region or this drier core here in Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio that not all the drought indicators, the things that we look for are necessarily lining up uh, harmoniously. So one of the things that we can do, we've got a, a number of tools. I've just shown two here, a couple of tools to look at basically a, um, a quick response to, to the drying conditions that we've seen. So that we have quick dry, it's really the snapshot of how, how different compared to average either dry or wet conditions have been over the last four weeks. And so it really picks out that core of, of dryness from Iowa into, into parts of uh, Ohio here. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, it shows the very wet conditions that, that still remain across the Dakotas and into Nebraska. Another one we look at is kind of a thirst of the atmosphere. It's the evaporative demand drought index. Anyway, so, so it's indicating 
you know, clearly some some indication of drought potential. That's what this is really about is a potential, not necessarily where it's occurring across parts of the eastern uh, Corn Belt, whereas back again in the Dakotas or, or the heart of the plains here, uh, wetness categories kind of hold true. So uh, using that and many other tools, obviously this week with the U.S. Drought Monitor being released this morning, uh, if we look across our region from the plains to, to the eastern Corn Belt region, we can see uh, we've got a little bit more uh, yellow, painted yellow, and, and even the, the, the beige color, which is indicating moderate drought across the region. So we've seen increases in, in coverage of, of D0, D1, and even D2 uh, drought here across, across the entire region. So now we've introduced the D1 drought categories in parts of Iowa and Illinois, and some pockets even extending into other areas as well. And then we've got D1 and D2 uh, up here in North Dakota across the region and in parts of Montana as well. So uh, dry conditions being added to this part of, of our country. Uh, we look at the drought monitor and the change from the last month really picks up on that drying area again from central Iowa through Illinois and Indiana and even some parts of Ohio and, and Michigan as well that we've had a bit of scattered activity that's perhaps kept that at bay just a little bit. And it also extends down into parts of, of uh, Kentucky as well. Again, remembering those soil moisture uh, uh, plots that I showed a little bit ago, kind of indicating some of the, the, the reasons for increasing our abnormally dry conditions uh, across these states. So that's kind of a, a, a kind of a glimpse at all of the, the climate indicators and things that we use. We now are going to talk about the, uh, the impacts on, on various different um, uh, sectors here. First, we're just really talking about the ag impacts and, and all season long with, with the late planting um, and, and the difficult conditions that farmers have faced across the Midwest and the Great Plains, we've really been walking a tightrope of accumulating enough growing heat units, what we call growing degree days versus really stressing out the crops where areas are getting dry. Uh, so the, the maps on the right are, are from the USDA and just looking at departures uh, from, uh, well, I should say first, the total growing degree days, and this is based on a March 1st uh, date, uh, which is important because a lot of planning was, was considerably later than this, obviously. So to, to kind of look at the growing degree day accumulation um, from March 1st may, may be a little bit more of a stretch, but here, but, but looking at the change, there are some clear indications of this west to east gradient uh, of growing degree days across the area. So much of, of the central region and the plains and much of the Midwest are lagging behind in the growing degree days. And that's especially true if you're looking even more uh, at dates from since April 1st or even May 1st. Whereas parts of the Eastern Corn Belt, for instance, the growing degree days aren't lagging. Actually, they're a little bit ahead of the long-term average here. So the rest of the season is really about getting warm enough, again, to accumulate and, and reach maturity, promote growth while not causing too much stress on the crops. Uh, one of the cool tools out there is the U2U corn growing degree day tool. And it's really good for looking at your specific situation. And so you can follow that link there at the bottom right, put in your information in terms of uh, 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 crops and the maturity uh, dates as well. And it can really let you know whether you're, you're, you're ahead or behind in terms of the growing degree days uh, for your location. Part of the struggle, again, uh, we can look at the topsoil moisture here. Uh, looking at percent surplus, South Dakota, on, on the figure on the left here, South Dakota really sticks out as a frequent rains have, have really increased the surplus moisture in this region. So it's up to 31% of surplus there ending last week. And again, that, that drier area from Iowa through the eastern portions of the region, much of the region, you see an increase in the percent short to very short in the eastern eastern edge. So you can see from Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, even Missouri and Michigan as well, uh, these increases in the percent short to very short soil moisture. Again, indicating drying conditions taking place in this part of, of the country. If we look at some of the, the progress on, on our major crops here, uh, much of the region, if we're looking at corn progress in terms of percent silking, uh, is, is behind uh, the the five-year average here across across the region, so parts of Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Indiana in particular. 
And then because conditions, uh, you know, kind of the late planting start also across the Dakotas, uh, there's even, you know, a, a slow corn progress across the entire region. Uh, if you look at the corn conditions, uh, the conditions are, are a bit better across the northern Great Plains and Central Plains, parts of Iowa and Wisconsin, whereas that stretch from Missouri across into, into uh, Ohio here is looking at corn conditions that are well behind the five-year average. Uh, and and we, we got this photo here on the bottom left. This is from Purdue Extension. Uh, this is from central Indiana, and this is what they're dealing with, with a crop that a few weeks ago with the, with the you know, getting it in and, and having plenty of moisture probably looked quite good. And now with very rapidly drying soil conditions, uh, the crop's not looking so great. And so the corn conditions have kind of um, started to pull back a bit in that eastern Corn Belt region. Similar things can be said for soybeans. Uh, soybean progress is behind across our, our region, except maybe in, in Minnesota there. Uh, this is indicating percent that are blooming greatly behind in the eastern portions of our region, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. Uh, and these are similar, you know, as far as the, the soybean conditions go, very similar geographically compared to the corn. So there's a lot of talk about very short soybean, a lot of uh, blooming or pods that are going to be filling close to the ground. Uh, so even in places where they look good, say out in the Dakotas or even Nebraska, the uh, soybean conditions are good. Uh, there's still some indication that they're a bit short and shorter than usual. To look at crop conditions on wheat here, winter wheat, uh, it's pretty much wrapped, uh, wrapped up across the southern uh, states of our region, uh, turning more to spring uh, wheat across the northern plains. It's in good condition. Uh, but the humidity and, and rainfall across the Dakotas, parts of Minnesota and, and Montana are really slowing the harvest a bit uh, there on the wheat. Pasture and range conditions, uh, pretty good if you're looking at, you know, the western central plains region, the Dakotas, Montana, up into Minnesota. And again, where it's been a bit drier, those conditions have been falling uh, uh, a little bit. Illinois, Indiana, uh, in particular stick out as those areas where pastures aren't doing so well as it's been pretty dry across that region. So there are a number of, of ag discussion items really, you know, the ongoing issues that we've had that we're going to continue to, to see play out over the next several months. The delayed planting in many areas mean crops are still behind um, and, and some folks are concerned about whether, you know, crops are going to reach maturity in time. And again, I would really urge using that growing degree day tool for your specific area. A lot of ongoing discussion about beating a potential hard freeze. Uh, now, in general, freeze dates have, have you know, long-term average. They've been getting a little bit later. So our frost-free season in general has been getting a little bit longer. Uh, it's too hard to tell right now the precise dates that we're going to see these hard freezes. Uh, but certainly that's a concern out there. Uh, the switch to drier conditions from central Iowa toward the east means there's been a lot of signs of crop stress, as I showed in the previous photo. A lot of that's magnified by the fact that crops went into very wet soil, so they have a really shallow root structure as well. Um, recent uh, acreage reports and estimates from the USDA show some bas basically a drop in, in some of the uh, you know the acreage and, and yields expected here with corn and soybean as well. In particular, Ohio, we've got 1.5 million acres that would normally be planted with crops that are that are essentially lying fallow this year. Uh, that's a big hit to the industry here in Ohio, and it's 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 pretty pretty big, you know, it's pretty stark when you drive across our counties of the Northwest Ohio, where farmers never never got equipment out of the barn. They never had an opportunity to do so. Some of those, uh, you know, prevent plant acres. A lot of talk has been how do we how do we manage that? Weed, weeds are a big issue, uh, you know, in fields that have been inaccessible, for instance, because of wet soils. That, that continues to be the case in parts of South Dakota, Iowa, and other Nebraska areas that have been very wet. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of report of a lot of tillage taking place in parts of Northwest Ohio and parts of South Dakota as well. Uh, so all of these management of prevent acres is, is an ongoing discussion item. Uh, we've had minimal plant diseases as of yet in many places, but we'll have to see again how that plays out over the next couple months. Uh, and, and another little silver lining here is, you know, with plenty of precipitation in the western two-thirds part of Nebraska, particularly for that state, the irrigation demand has been a bit low. So just a, a, a myriad of, of ag impacts that are occurring because of the conditions across our region. 
Some other water issues that we have, the high lake uh, levels that I mentioned are highly visible. We've got loss of beach area, lakeshore flooding, loss of boat launch ramps uh, in South Dakota and other parts as well. I mentioned local communities enforcing no wake zones uh, in certain locations to keep down on the flooding from passing boats. Uh, some some uh, reports or comments coming out of, of Minnesota on, on cities deciding what to do with higher uh, inland levels of, of their lakes. We're dealing with algal bloom reports not only on Lake Erie, but South Dakota, Iowa, Ohio, and other areas as well. And even with all that rain in South Dakota, we've had you know recent um, shutdown of the South Dakota rail line that's not serving any stations west of the Missouri River here. So uh, that heavy rain that's falling in parts of South Dakota have a lot of other issues and a lot of other impacts besides just the ag impacts that are happening. We've had a couple of other major events across the region as well, in particular with hail. Uh, so we have some reports from Minnesota, some big hail happening on August 5th. Uh, you can see that that link for some more you know more report on on that particular event uh, out in Colorado the Colorado Climate Center are, are will be convening the state extremes uh, committee basically to look at some hail that fell out there that that is most likely uh, could could eclipse the record there it's 4.83 inches in diameter they're also examining a heat record back in July of 115 for a location there so some interesting things that are happening and events. Although the reports of severe weather have been a bit on the low side across the region, we certainly have had isolated severe weather uh, events and some tornadoes also occur throughout the region. All right, so in the last few minutes that I have here, we really wanna go through the climate outlooks, uh, the seven day precipitation, kind of the eight to 14 day outlook, check in with the tropics and see uh, if we've got anything happening there that, that's interesting. Uh, and then also look at September and then into the harvest season here. So we'll start with the seven day, and this is a, a, a quantitative precipitation forecast from the Weather Prediction Center. It's valid from 7 a.m. Uh, Central Time today through 7 a.m. next Thursday. And it's essentially, uh, if the forecast, the, the, comes to fruition, this is what, what we're expecting over the next seven days. So there's really a bullseye there in parts of uh, uh, Northeast Kansas, Northwest Missouri, uh, extending into parts of Southern Illinois, and in those very dry areas across Illinois, parts of, uh, sorry, Iowa, Illinois, uh, Central Missouri as well. So this area that, that has been dry and we've introduced uh, some drought this week, uh, over the next seven days, it's looking like the potential uh, for you know more than an inch of rain, maybe upwards of three inches, if this comes to fruition. Again, that's important to remember that this is a forecast. And then some of that rain still lingering across parts of the Dakotas up into Minnesota, a little bit heavier in Wisconsin, then extending even across dry areas that we've seen across Indiana and parts of, of uh, Ohio as well. Southern portions, most of this lower, or th this portion of the Ohio River Valley, not so much rainfall expected this week. And also in parts of, of North Dakota where drought is, is also ongoing, not a lot of precipitation expected this week either. Extending out to the eight to 14 day, looking at both temperature and precipitation probabilities. The way you look at this is what's the probability or of seeing above or below or near normal conditions. Uh, so we've got some, some, you know, in this August 22nd through August 28th timeframe from the Climate Prediction Center, uh, looking at increased probability of below average temperatures in the northern Great Plains from Montana into parts of the Dakotas. The rest of the region, uh, the, the conditions look like we've got a, a, an increased probability of above average temperatures, especially across the eastern region in the Great Lakes, and then again across parts of, of Colorado and far southwestern parts of, of Kansas as well. As far as precipitation goes, we see a lot of green through the region. I would say, uh, you know, confidence is, is quite a bit higher for parts of northern Minnesota and Wisconsin for above average precip for the eight to 14 day. A little less so and uh, over much of the region, maybe a little bit higher probability there in parts of Montana as well. Uh, a little bit elevated below average um, precipitation expected across parts of Colorado again, and then parts of Southwest Kansas as well. The hazards during this time frame, uh, just 
really pulled back on 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 some excessive heat we really aren't expecting large excessive heat though it's going to remain warm across much of the region uh, but the excessive heat slight chances pulled back to southern parts of Colorado and southern Kansas and again with that probability of above average precip across the northern Midwest uh, there's a slight chance of a risk of heavy precipitation uh, up in this part of the region turning to the tropics now um, as of August 12th, the Climate Prediction Center uh, issued their final El Nino advisory. So we're, we've had this weak El Nino over the last several months. Uh, it's really waned now and neutral conditions have been reestablished across uh, the tropical Pacific. Now, what's that mean? Well, we, we look at sea surface temperatures and we compare those to average over a long period of time. And, and what you're seeing here in the graph where you've got cooler than average or cool temperatures across the Eastern Pacific and warmer temperatures across the Western Pacific, that's what we tend to see during ENSO neutral or, or El Nino neutral, sorry, ENSO neutral conditions. So this is what we generally expect. So we've seen our, well, our weak El Nino now come down to these neutral conditions. And, and the, the, the forecast, and that's what the forecast is showing down here, uh, is looking at these neutral conditions will remain uh, throughout the Northern Hemisphere winter, this upcoming winter. It's about a 50 to 55 percent chance and the way that works is you just uh, if you're looking at the lines this is the long-term climate climatological expectation it's a long-term climatological expectation and, and what you're looking at here neutral conditions again above that 50 percent line through november december and january and even into the core of the winter as well so that's why we're expecting those conditions to remain neutral now, as we start to look at our harvest season, again, the probabilities throughout much of September, uh, below average, a higher than, than um, sorry, an elevated probability of below average temperatures across parts of Montana and the Dakotas as well. Kind of equal chances for above, below, and near normal temperatures across much of the Midwest and the Central Plains, and maybe slightly elevated probability of warmer than average conditions across the Far East and into Colorado as well. With that, there's an increased probability of above average precipitation, again, remaining across the, the Dakotas, parts of Minnesota, and even in areas that are currently under drought that could, that could use some rainfall. Right now, the Climate Prediction Center has an increased probability of, of precipitation in this part of, of the region as well. And then extending out even further, looking at the September through November outlook, the entire region, the Climate Prediction Center, paints an elevated probability of warmer than average temperatures. This is largely driven by trends with these uh, ENSO neutral conditions here. Uh, we are getting some really elevated probabilities here of temperatures across parts of Colorado. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And again, uh, with precipitation, a good chunk of the areas under this uh, increased probability of above average precip from the Dakotas uh, down into parts of Wyoming and, and Colorado as well with equal chances throughout much of the Midwest and eastern part of the Corn Belt. So the monthly outlook on drought we actually uh, the Climate Prediction Center and, and is looking at a little bit of you know improvement in some of those dry core areas again with that increased probability of above average precipitation some improvement across North Dakota as well uh, maybe some persistence in in this little pocket of of Kansas though much of the region not expecting big changes in terms of our conditions and no real significant fire potential throughout our region uh, as well so to summarize today's uh, um, broadcast here we, we're looking at near average temperatures in the western portion of uh, you know the central plains and and uh, the northern plains as well above average across the eastern midwest region uh, we've had very wet conditions persist across the missouri basin and south dakota in particular again hindering those efforts to release uh, the water and get uh, from the reservoirs dry conditions extending from central iowa through ohio have stressed out crops a bit and introduced pockets of drought to the area and we expect those you know both the dry conditions and also those those effects from from the very wet first half of the year uh, to kind of persist in terms of the agricultural impacts that are going to be felt for months to come we've got our weak el nino that that's really weakened to neutral conditions now so when we look out into the long-term trends it's really dominated by warmer than average temperatures across the region 
Uh, and, and there's a little bit of hope, obviously, that, that we can keep that freeze uh, at bay, no early freezes across the region, so that crops have, have an opportunity to mature. So as always, we've got a lot of partners that, that make this possible. You can find today and, and past recorded presentations at the links there, uh, and, and also um, you know, links to the various partners throughout the region. And if you've got any questions uh, that you can reach out now uh, on the broadcast, but also reach out to Dennis, Doug, uh, or myself. And I wanna thank you for your participation and, and we'll go ahead and, and we'll take questions. Thank you. All right, Aaron, thank you um, for that presentation. That was uh, very good, very complete. Uh, we don't have any questions um, at the moment, but uh, we certainly could uh, talk about a few things in terms of what's typical in July and August in terms of soil moisture across a lot of the region. Um, and, and, and by the way, Dennis Toddy from USDA uh, uh, is on the call as well, so he will probably want to chime in on some of this stuff too. Um, uh, I think you showed uh, Aaron something um, about soil moisture earlier in the presentation, and, and, and it showed that there was above normal, uh, above normal soil moisture in a lot of areas. There was also uh, changes, you showed changes in soil moisture and all that kind of stuff, and then you showed also where it's been uh, relatively wet. I, and, and sort of typically, if you just sort of look at the cycle of, uh, of the way soils moisten up, you know, in the spring and actually in the winter and, and, and fall and such, uh, because there's not a lot of growth, there's not a lot of extraction from that soil. That's the wetter time of year, and and when you do get into July, maybe even late June, July, August, and September, you you tend to draw down anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's not unusual to see soil soils drying out this time of year. There's a lot more going into the plants and just uh, evapo evaporation and everything else because of um, sun angle and all that. It's just warmer. It just tends to happen. Um, so I, I don't. I, I, that's not a big alarm type of thing. What's what's more alarming <laughs> to me is that we've had 12 months in a lot of places of of, of record of of record precipitation, and um, um, we, we we sort of need to dry out generally uh, from that in a lot of places like South Dakota uh, and and a few other places. So, um, um, any other comments along those lines, Dennis or, or Aaron? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take a little bit of that. And and Doug, you you hit on on some really interesting points that I don't think we talk enough about in the way of soil moisture. That was part of our issue this spring. Is obviously we had a large amount of input to the soil moisture starting last fall, but without able to get a crop planted and with the, the cool and wet conditions there was you know very little way of removing water from that soil you can drain water but then water still is that field capacity basically it's 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 holding all the water that it can and and that won't you'll know, evaporate some from the surface but to be able to dry down soils you need to get something growing in it and start removing the water from the soil by the plant growth and you are you are correct by this time of year uh, plants are using more water out of the soil, extracting more water from the soil, going through its photosynthetic activity, than is being put back into the soil. So therefore you do typically get a drawdown. Uh, but that's also been part of our problem this year is that uh, plants have not been able to develop deeper root systems to get down far enough in some cases to get down, you know, Corn and soybean plants will root four, five, even six feet sometimes if available. But because of the wet soils this year, they, the roots have not been able to get down and, and into that moisture. So there's in some cases moisture there, but the plant just is not able to get access to it because the roots have not been reaching it. Okay. Um I just want to talk a little bit about, there was a question about El Nino, La Nina, neutral and all that business. So um, there's actually a question about that. Hold on a second. Um, um, uh, just a little bit of a clarification from us. Uh, did, did, did we say we moved from a weak uh, 
El Nino, uh, it says Enso, but I think it means El Nino to a neutral one. And and yes, uh, we were in a relatively weak El Nino. Oh, golly, it started late this year officially, and we can get into semantics if you want to. But really, last winter into uh, spring and early summer, we were in uh, what we call an El Nino period. And so that um, later in the winter, there was some effect probably from that. Uh, we're now in what we call a neutral, so there's not a lot of guidance in terms. It's not helping us predict, if you will, very much when it comes to this fall and this, especially this winter. And um, it's one of the major pieces of prediction. I can't tell you what percent it is, but it's a large piece of how we are uh, we we can predict a little bit on um, upcoming uh, the upcoming seasons, especially like I said, late fall into winter and sometimes early spring. Um, this year is in, is particularly oh, a little bit particularly different than some other years. Usually by this time, um, August and September, we have a uh, a trend towards uh, a solid, or the models at least, usually see a trend towards a particular type of uh, scenario. In other words, it's okay, it's going to be neutral for sure, we'll have higher percentage, higher probabilities of that happening, or it'll be La Nina or El Nino that we're sort of gearing up for. Uh, this year, uh, there is not much trend in the models. The models, I don't, you can call them confused, you can call them what you want, but they're not giving us a lot of, they're not giving us a lot of uh, probability one way or the other. Um, it's unlikely that we'll go into a La Nina, I suppose, but uh, um, it's, but, but there's less than normal predictive capacity <laughs> for whatever reason. That that I cannot explain. Um, any, any other comments about that? Okay. So uh, it, it's a t it's a tough field, I'll tell you. Um, this climate prediction stuff, especially when you get out, uh, um, I don't know, six months from now. So uh, without without a little bit of guidance, if you will, from from the from the tropical Pacific, uh, it, it makes our job even harder. That's probably what I'd say about that. Uh, yeah, the effects, and then a, another part of that question was, have the effects of that El Nino sort of dissipated? And in, in, uh, I think I think they have. Um, again, Dennis or Aaron, um, have you heard any more uh, in terms of uh, impacts from El, the last El Nino? I, you know, I, I think the impact of the last El Nino was part of what we saw in the late winter and spring. There was, there was, uh, that was included in the outlooks when we talked about it uh, with the Climate Prediction Center. And, you know, typically El Nino summers tend to be good for us in most, of, in most of our growing season. And this really wouldn't have been too bad a growing season if it had not been for the excessively wet start and the delay in planting. Um, so, it, yeah, and and we're going to start hearing more in in September and especially especially in October um, next month. I think uh, our North Dakota state climatologist Adnan Akius will be the will be the presenter, and I, and I'm sure he'll have a little bit more to say in terms of um, it, well, definitely in terms of early freezes and what we see coming and all that kind of stuff in the next few weeks and all that kind of business. Um, but I, in October, we're going to have a, a much better handle on, fingers crossed, fingers crossed on uh, sort of the outlook for the winter and, and, and maybe, I won't say that early spring, I'll just say for the winter and, and such. We'll also have um, a guy from the USDA on named Brad Rippey. We've had him on the last few years, several years actually. Uh, he'll, he's going to team up with um, uh, another presenter, uh, Laura Edwards from South Dakota, to, to sort of... Uh, give an end of the growing season uh, synopsis on what happened. <laughs> Not why necessarily, but uh, what. Uh, so you can look forward to that over the next couple couple months. Um, it, it, is, it has been a phenomenal, and I don't mean that in a good way, a phenomenal year 
and in, in many respects from uh, certainly from an ag community, but also from a transportation and uh, point of view as well. You know, there's still major issues in the, in the Missouri River uh, floodplain uh, below uh, uh, below Gavin's point. Uh, you, you heard about the Corps uh, having to release so much water still this time of year. I mean, it, that that's just uh, it's very unusual. Um, but they have to get their flood pools down to get ready for next year and all that business. So um, we don't like seeing necessarily above normal precipitation uh, probabilities for the northern plains and all that kind of stuff. So those are those are potentials, I suppose. We'll have to watch very closely um, with our partner agencies on that kind of stuff. So, all right. Uh, Aaron, anything else you want to say about Ohio uh, or anything else, really, any place else? Um, or, um, or or Dennis, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to close this month out? I, I don't really have anything else to say other than, um, yeah, I mean, we're just hoping that we get the maturity along where, where crops are growing and we can keep that early freeze from happening and we'll kind of uh, turn this around maybe just a little bit. We'll see. Yeah. And Dennis, anything on prevent plant or anything across the country? Um, we we certainly, you know, we, we need the frost freeze condition to go as late as possible to allow maturity to reach. We know there's going to be some corn that won't reach maturity no matter what because it was planted so late. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that very closely. We'll talk more about frost and freeze and there are various states and we're working on an effort of, of a little publication to talk more about frost freeze that we'll be sharing soon. Oh, hey, um, I made a major mistake. Sorry about that. I have a couple uh, other um, comments, questions in here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, can you go back to the El Nino La Nina slide again, the probability one? Sorry quickly as you can. Um, I think we went through this discussion and now I'll and blow it up if you will. There you go. Yep. Uh, 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 Carolyn, if you had any questions, uh, feel free to type one in about that. Um, we, I, we did discuss that very shortly. Yeah. Um, and Mark, we did talk about Enso and Jim. I'm sorry. Recently heard the Department of Agriculture corn crop may reach near record levels does this does not seem to agree with your slide on corn growing conditions hey uh dennis do you want to address that at all or oh jeez i know <laughs> i know well i mean it, it, it is a good it's a great question actually uh, but there, yeah. it's not an easy yeah. answer i don't think no there is not uh there are huge questions about what this corn crop is going to look like and the soybean crop and what it's going to look like because of, you know, USDA has a methodology in how it assesses yield potential based on survey and some other additional information. I am not completely familiar with how the, the process goes. Uh, the report that came out was a bit surprising to people because they, the, the thought was that USDA was going to lower the, the production estimates. You know, the, the real problems that are involved here this year are um, how many acres actually did get planted because there was even discrepancy on how many acres were planted uh, between the and it was a difference between the survey part of, of USDA and NAS and what was actually reported to the risk management agency and and, and their prevent plant claims so there was a bit of, of, of a difference there and then how much is actually yield on the acreage that did get planted so that's what leads to a huge confusion in this whole situation. Now, the, the situation we're dealing with, unlike drought years where things get bad and they tend just to stay bad, you know, once you do damage, damage has been done, there's still a lot of moisture out there. So the, the overall crop conditions have kind of stabilized. They've not gotten worse, but they've not gotten a whole lot better. So they're still kind of limping along and there will probably be, you know, there, there's still an opportunity for corn and beans to yield decently uh, because we've not stressed them too badly at this point. Um, but 
legitimately, yes, it, it is a big issue and um, we're gonna have to wait and see what actually comes out of the field in the situation because things are not done yet. We are stressing, Aaron talked about the, the, the drought area where we're stressing crops on the, on the dry side now. We went wet early and now we've gone dry, so we're losing some there. And then some of the excessively wet areas we're, we're gonna have problems with going along too. So um, stay tuned. That's not, the short answer is just stay tuned because there's still a lot to be answered in this whole situation. Yeah. All right, and on that note, I think it's two o'clock here in my office anyway. So I'm gonna say uh, thank you very, very much everyone for coming. Thanks Aaron for the excellent presentation and uh, thanks Dennis for helping answer questions. And uh, we will see you all next month, I hope, on um, September 19th at 1 p.m. Central Time. Thanks and have a great day and weekend. Bye-bye.